Welcome to LifeSpot.com, where we prove ancient medical wisdom with modern science. And tonight, my podcast is called How to Overcome Unwanted Emotions. Um, this is a, a really important topic, I think, in, in a lot of ways, because you know a lot of us have just come home from the holidays, and we just sort of bumped up against a lot of our old emotions, right? We go, for the holiday, we go home for the holidays, and we start acting like a four-year-old again. We realize that my mom, my dad, and my sister, and my brother, and my relatives, they trigger us to start behaving like we did when we were four, five, six, 10, 12 years old. And we let those people trigger us. We let their behavior make us into something that we're not. So we start reacting to their behavior which isn't really their behavior. It's what they are projecting on the screen that they think will make them feel liked, approved of, more secure or safe. So we all do that, right? Fundamentally, we are all trying to be liked, to be appreciated, to be approved of, and to be safe. And we all figure out a way to do that, you know? And we all want to be a little bit taller, a little bit prettier. We want hair, I love hair. Uh, we all want something we don't have. It's always gonna do, right? Somebody bigger, smarter, smart, taller, prettier, better athlete, better musician, better everything than us, right? It's always gonna be somebody that has, that we sort of would want to be like. The problem is not that that's our desire, because that's a fundamental human desire. The problem is the, the extreme nature, the, the overfeeding of that desire that we've created in this culture. And we've lost sort of our ancient wisdom, and we have no modern science to turn us back, to turn the tide back, to the wisdom of the ancient culture. So what am I talking about? Okay, so let's start from the beginning, right? You're a little kid, you're born, uh, you realize that your safety and your security and your survival is based on mom and dad. So you quickly learn that I will do anything to get their approval, anything to get their attention. And I quickly learn that if I laugh and be something cute, they laugh. Um, if I do something really nice, they give me a toy. I quickly learn how to manipulate my environment to get them to like me, care for me, love me, appreciate it, approve me, and make me feel safe, right? If I didn't have that hardwired construct inside of me neurologically, I, as a child, I would have, we all would have wandered into the jungle thousands of years ago, got eaten by lions, and there would be no people here. So we all do this thing where we clearly are dependent on the approval of our mom and dad. And we do that. We've always, we find toys and we find shopping and we find sneakers and we find boyfriends and girlfriends and money and fame and power. And all of a sudden we get started feeding ourselves on more of these uh, reward hormones, dopamine, the reward chemistry. I think the, the extreme version of that is the, the, the great study done on when they took a group of women into a mall and they, they wanted to buy, uh, they were at a shoe store and they were all trying on shoes and they were measuring their dopamine levels throughout this, this whole study. And they saw that as they were trying on each different shoe, their dopamine levels, which is a reward hormone, right? It makes you feel like, satisfied. So you get this reward chemistry from putting on this shoe and oh, I love that one. Oh, that's a, even a prettier one with it. I want that. I try that on. You're walking around trying on. Dopamine levels are rising and, and rising and, and rising. And then finally, the women all selected the shoe that they thought would change their life. And they went, took it to the counter and they swiped their credit card. And all of a sudden, the dopamine levels crash for all these women. So then the brain says, whoa, what happened? The brain pulls down the menu and says, how do I get 
back up to that place that we felt so good, that dopamine. I love that up there. We just felt so wonderful. And the brain pulls down the menu. Well, there's many ways to accomplish that, to get from down there to up there. I saw a Mrs. Fields chocolate chip cookie. There was a Starbucks. There was a Cinnabon. There was an Annie's pretzel place or whatever else they have. And, and then we're like, they all made this decision to go for Mrs. Fields chocolate chip cookies. And all of a sudden, as they start walking for chocolate chip cookies or a Starbucks, the dopamine levels begin to start to rise. In studies show, as soon as people see the logo of Starbucks, their dopamine levels start to rise. So we have become addicted to that. Now, when you think about that, that's fine. Part of our, part of our, our culture and who we are as a culture is that drive to accomplish things and make good things happen. But in traditional cultures, there were things like rites of passage, bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs. Um, traditional cultures had rites of passage that young children, young men, young women would go through to prepare themselves for being an adult, being a parent. And most importantly, severing the relationship of needing mom and dad's approval anymore. Needing the love and the approval of mom and dad. Not that we never stopped loving them or in fact, it's amped up, if anything, but we don't need it. Uh, a leopard, for example, will take care of the baby leopard until a certain period of their life. And at one point, the mama leopard says, I'm going north and you're going south and stop following me. You're on your own. And all of a sudden, that leopard has to break the tie of needing love and approval and start to be themselves. This is a Vedic concept. It's called it's called either the Western version of it is called objective uh, referral or subjective referral. Am I referring my experience of life, everything I think and say and do based on the objects outside of me, objective referral? Am I letting my mother and my uncle and my grandmother make me into something I'm not, a version of self that I'm not? That's called objective referral. Subjective referral means I'm referring to myself. And I'm doing me. So the simple way of saying it is, are you doing me or are you doing them? Who are you doing, right? Am I doing me? Am I letting the very delicate petals of my flower open and letting myself out? Or am I armored up in protection and survival? And am I engaging in behavior that I think they will like? And I think they will approve of. And I got these clothes that I think they will like and I think they will approve of. And how much energy do I spend every single day making sure that I am prepared, whether it be for my boss or for my partner or for attracting a, a partner or a boss? How much energy do we put into our day just to, in general, be appealing to and, and be getting approval from the outside world? Nothing really wrong with that either. I mean, that's just part of nature to do that. But again, it's a you know, it's all over nature, right? In 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 breeding patterns and things like that. But is it way out of whack in our culture when you think about how much energy is put into us putting wanting to get the approval and the attention of others? This is where we have to begin to draw the line. So what we have as a culture that has become addicted to the reward chemistry. Okay, so we're a young kid. We create <clears throat> these emotional patterns of behavior that we realize very quickly will get us to get approval from mom and dad. We continue to project those patterns of behavior on the screen until we're an adult. Now we're projecting similar patterns of behavior as an adult that may be serving you and may not be serving you. you. Go home for the holidays and you find out that, whoa, all of a sudden letting my mom and dad make me react to something that I'm not. Now, how does this affect us? Clearly, we all carry old emotional trauma. We, you know, how many times were you let down? How many times did you not get your way? How many times did you get a birthday present or a Christmas present that you didn't like or you didn't think was right or you didn't think that it, they really thought about you enough? Your mind is in charge of all of that. Your mind keeps a mathematical record. It's like a balancing thing. It says, okay, this is my mind is all about balance. Everything has to balance, okay? So 
So if I give you a birthday present for $20, I would expect one for $20 over here. But if I give you one for, for birthday present for $20 and you give me one from the dollar store, then all of a sudden I'm feeling like you owe me $19 worth of something. So I am going to then use my mind to create an emotion, right? To create a molecule of emotion or a pattern or patterns of behavior to make sure that I never get hurt again. And I'm gonna put that emotion into a reserve package as a molecule of emotion. I'm gonna store it in my fat and store it in my muscle. Ayurveda calls it mental ama. Candace Pert, the late Candace Pert, wrote the book called The Molecules of Motion. Now we're having more and more science emerging saying that these emotions actually cause a lot of things. They cause old patterns of behavior, they even cause pain. We'll talk about that in a minute. So, so, so all of a sudden, these I got hurt feelings again and again and didn't get my way, didn't get loved, didn't get appreciated, approved of. And none of us ever got enough because we're, the mind will never be satisfied, it's insatiable. So every one of us created, as your time we got hurt feelings, we created an emotional pattern. We project that on the screen to get us a reward chemistry to make us feel safe and secure. Soon that became who we are. The rite of passage was for us to realize that that's not who I am. That's who I had to be to be safe and secure in this world. And I'm projecting that on the screen and the return on the investment as I sort of feel safe for a little while, but then I gotta project something else on the screen for that person because somebody else just walked in the room and I have to be this way to make them like me and this way to make them like me and this way to make them like me. So I'm like juggling all these balls different ways for different people to get them to like me. And I am overwhelmed by the stress and the radar and the input for what I have to do to feel safe and secure to help myself feel calm and all that stress plows right through our gut, our intestinal tract. And who lives there? The 90% of the cells in your body, your microbes, who feel everything. Those bugs feel everything. They, you, put, you put microbes of somebody next to a social disruptor, an anxious, angry person, that experience of being next to that stressed out, angry person, will change your microbiome, change your gut bugs. So they feel it all. Epigenetically, they feel it all. It's just sort of a phenomenal kind of a thing. So, so when we have all this stress plowing through our intestinal tract, taking out our good bugs, the bugs go, whoa, it's crazy out there. They send a message to the brain, the brain goes, yep, hey, they're having a problem down there. That's like the, that's where you like, in Ayurveda, we call it the, the seat of the nervous system. In Western medicine, they call it the second brain. And the second brain is saying, it's crazy out there. Tell everybody there's a war on. And all of a sudden, we send fight or flight, emergency, stress hormones to every cell of the body. And now we're breaking down as a result of stress. I think it, it's, it's phenomenal that this, and we know stress is the leading cause of 80% of disease. We know that stress is a major culprit. Uh, a book written uh, a while back, um, years ago, I don't know if it was years ago, um, um, and um, by Dr. John Sarno. It was, it was a book called Mind Over Back Pain. And it was research that he did on the fact that stress, emotional stress, was his, he felt, was the absolute underpinning for all pain in the body and uh, would help people become more aware of their emotions. And I thought that was a fascinating book. I wanna read a couple of the passages from his book that I thought were sort of phenomenal because they're so Vedic. Not his whole book is Vedic because there's some things I don't agree with or that aren't Vedic anyway. Um, but one of them, he says that it's not changing one's emotions it's recognizing they exist, and the brain is trying to keep one from being aware of their existence and their connection to the pain syndrome. So we use our, our mind to distract ourselves from the truth. So you get hurt feelings, you create an emotional pattern, and you created a behavioral pattern, you see your parents and you're acting that way again, right? 
that same emotional pattern can be manifest as pain chemistry, according to his research, which I thought is pretty powerful. So, you know, he's, he's saying that, that people have, you know, normal x-rays on and have pain and people have broken down spines and have no pain. He's done a lot of research on this and um, it's sort of, uh, sort of interesting. So, so there's more to this. So this, there was a study done a while back that said that you and I, all of us, in the first six years of life, um, we, uh, we, we, in those first six years of life, 95% of the things that we think and say and do throughout the day all come from the impressions made in the first six years of life. Those are called unconscious behaviors, okay? So the goal to get rid of unwanted emotions, which is the point of this whole discussion, is to become conscious, right? Because we're not conscious. I mean, science shows us pretty clearly that 95% of the things we think and say and do are unconscious. There's also our heart beating and our breathing that's unconscious as well. But in the mix of all that 95% is the fact that what I'm thinking and saying right now, impressions, how I interact with my mom and dad when I go home for holidays and act like a four-year-old, those are totally unconscious behaviors. How I interact with my wife and children, unconscious behaviors, right? So I was reading this book about mind over back pain, you know, and I've actually had some back pain lately. And so I'm reading this book, I'm just, you know, going, okay, I must have some unwanted, really bad emotions, right? And I'm appearing for this lecture and thinking about it a lot. So I, the other day for breakfast over the weekend, I, I sat down with my family, my kids, I said, okay, kids, and my wife was there. I said, look, I said, I'm having this back pain, um, which is getting better, but, um, and I've always had a little bit of a weak back, right? So, and I said, is there some like underlying emotional pattern that I have that you guys don't like that you're not telling me? Is there something that you can kind of just tell me? Cause like, you know, I've been pining on this and I've been meditating on this and about what underlying pattern behavior that could be screwed up in me that be causing this pain. And, and, I, and I've got nothing <laughs> and they all laugh. And uh, actually I didn't say that, uh, I have plenty, but, and then, they all started like chiming in and I was like, okay, okay, enough, enough, enough. I can't, I could only do one thing at a time. But the point that I'm trying to make is that we, that what Ayurveda was designed to do was to become conscious. We had rites of passage to break the need to be loved and approved of and appreciated to be the love and the power and open the delicate petals of your, of your flower and let the truth of you out, the vulnerability of you out, the power of you out. Be the sun, let it shine. The sun doesn't care if the flowers blossom, doesn't care if you chop down its trees. It's gonna shine no matter what. It doesn't have any expectation that the flower should blossom. It has no expectation that anything's gonna happen on the moon because it hasn't in a billion years. It dropped the expectation many years ago. It's not gonna happen. We are the same. The minute that we are attached to the outcome, we are setting ourselves up for disappointment. I got a $1 gift from the dollar store and I gave him a $20 gift. I'm $19 in the hole here, help me. So I created a mental, the mind goes, sure, I got this, no problem. We can go get Starbucks, we can get a cinnamon. I can be mean, passive aggressive, I can throw darts, right? So how many people in your life, right? have thrown darts at you. I'm talking emotional darts, right? People who have thrown a dart because, you know, I don't know, they, uh, they have some anger towards you, okay? And they're being mean to you or passive aggressive to you, right? We've all experienced that. So there's three responses to that. Number one, you can throw a dart back, right? Number two, you can run away, walk away, leave the situation. But if you, if you, throw a dart at them and you th and they throw a dart at you, you throw a dart back chances are you're going to get more darts thrown at you if you walk away they're going to look and go oh see that guy didn't really like me anyway so good thing i threw a dart at them so the third choice the doing me choice or the doing you choice sort of right because it's either for me i'm doing me 
and I throw a dart back at them, I'm not doing me, I'm doing them. I am reacting to their behavior. They threw a dart at me, I throw a dart back. My throwing dart back was a reaction to them. It was objective referral. I was doing them, not me, right? If I walk away from them and I leave them because it's dangerous, turn the other cheek sort of, I'm also doing them. I'm reacting to their behavior, right? And I walk away and they feel if I walk away, like, see, they didn't really like me in the first place. So why? So oh, good, I threw a dart at them. And if I throw a dart back, they're definitely going to throw more darts, right? The third response is to realize with awareness doing you, or in this case, doing me, to realize that that person who threw a dart at me probably threw a dart at me because they were hurt. So through the window of understanding, through the window of compassion, I can go, wow, that person is throwing darts at me like that. There's a really good chance that they're really hurt. If I throw a dart at them, I'm only going to hurt them more. Expect more darts or run away from them. They're going to feel abandoned. Expect more darts. But what if I act on my true nature? Whoa. What is your true nature? Is your true nature the patterns of behavior you created as a result of being hurt millions and millions of times as a kid and not getting the right birthday present and creating these protective patterns of behavior that gave you the illusion of feeling safe and secure for the time being? Is that who you truly are? No. Think about a rose, for example. Roses millions of years ago didn't have thorns. And um, I have no idea if this is true. But let's pretend. Millions of years ago, roses didn't have thorns. And roses are very edible, by the way. They're really tasty. And animals love rose petals. And they eat them. And maybe get rose petal jam and Ayurveda, like it's a big thing. So they love rose petals. They ate them like crazy, right? And then one of the roses are like, we get trampled. And we're like getting eaten. This is ridiculous. So one of the roses said, what if we grow thorns? Other of those people have other bushes that have thorns. Why can't we just have a few little thorns? We don't even have flowers. And they're like, whoa, thorns, are you out of your mind? And they took a vote and they decided that they were going to do the thorns as long as they could like hide them under the leaf. And we didn't like the whole flower look, whole thing. No one really know. Obviously we all know, but the thorns became a thing because they were trampled on a regular basis. Think about this for a second. How many of us have been trampled, emotionally trampled? And how many of us had armored up? We tried to get attention this way, tried to get safe in this way, tried to get secure this way, never really got it done. So we started to protect and wall off and we became armored up. And eventually the armor became thorns. We started to shoot back. So when before you throw your next dart, we might want to think about, you know, becoming aware, more aware. And this is the beautiful thing of Ayurvedic medicine. Ayurvedic medicine was based on four words. Vedic medicine, yoga, breathing, meditation, all the Vedic sciences were based on four fundamental words. And in Vedic, in Sanskrit, they're called Yogastha Kuru, Kuru Kamani. Yogastha Kuru Kamani, which means to establish being or silence or silent awareness and then perform action. Establish being, perform action. That, those are the magic four words. And the whole thing hubs around that. Like, whoa, what does that mean? So if I just throw a dart at that person who threw a dart at me, am I establishing being, awareness, and then performing action from me? No, because who am I? Well, let me tell you. Years ago, if someone asked me that, I said, you know, our nature, human nature is love. And they're like, what? How do you know that? Like, what makes you think that? And I'm like, good question. I need to dig, some, dig into that and do some research. So I have written a lot about that in my emotional sex health know of my life spot website. You can get a lot of articles on this that I've written about this and a lot of the science behind what I'm going to tell you now. But well, here's what we know. We know that when people are loving and giving in kind, they produce a hormone called oxytocin. And that hormone oxytocin makes them live longer. It makes them healthier, helps them lose weight, helps them balance their hormones. It has all kinds of health benefits. So when you love and you give and you care, you create this hormone called oxytocin. And the more you make of it, the more you love and give and care, 
the more oxytocin you make. The flip side of that hormonal coin is dopamine. Dope, I mean, the more demanding you are for getting the return on investment, right? The bigger the ice cream cone, the more shots in my latte, the bigger jump I jump off of, the, the, the faster I can run, the more money I can make, the faster, beautiful, bigger car I can have. All that is more dopamine. And the more you stimulate a dopamine receptor, the next time it needs a bigger stimulation to give you the same juice. It is a limiting receptor. In other words, you have to continue to produce more and more of the stimulation to get the same juice. You need more coffee, more alcohol, more, like, right. When you think about that, if people think, oh, you're an addict, you're a drug addict, or you're an alcoholic, or you're a gambling addict, or you're a sex addict, whatever. I mean, all of us are addicts. Let's face it. How many, what do you do when you're stressed out? Do you go get a cup of coffee? Do you watch TV? Do you go to the movies? Do you, you know, what are, you know, do, do, do you engage in behaviors that are your go-to stress relievers? And could you live without them? Do they control you? That's the question, right? It's not that going to the movies or drinking alcohol or having any of those things are bad at all, but do they control you? or do you control them? Who's in charge here? There's another old saying in Ayurveda, Brahma Bhavati Sarati, which means that you're, who you are is driving in the chariot. The sun is driving in the chariot. And we, it means that the sun doesn't care what the outcome is. It's not attached to the fruits of the actions. The other little other kind of side note that describes all Vedic principles beyond the four words, establish, being, perform, action, is don't be attached to the fruits of your actions because it matters. So hear out this study, right? There was a study done on giving and one type of giving was called hedonistic giving. I give, but I give it hedonistically, which means I really hope you like the present. Do you like it? Does it fit? Do you like the right color? Was it the right size? That's hedonistic giving. I'm giving you a gift and I really like giving you the gift, but I really want to make sure you like it. Like I'm getting fed by the return on the investment. You with me? The other side of giving is called, is called eudaimonic giving. Eudaimonic giving means that, that I just love giving and I don't care if you love it. I'm not attached to that. I have just fallen in love with the giving with a big fat period at the end of that. So the whole thing says, I love you, but it's no concern of yours, which means I love you, honey, but I don't need you to love me back. I don't need you to make me dinner. I don't need you to do anything. I just love loving you. And I've fallen in love with loving you because I'm love, right? So check this out. The studies show that when they give hedonistically, it, people were happy, but it had no epigenetic effect. But when they gave eudaimonically with no expectation on the other side, it literally changed genet the genetic code. Epigenetically, it changed the genetic code. So in other words, when you are giving to someone and you're loving them so fully because it's who you are doing you, it changes them. When you love them or you do all this juggling to get them to like you, they don't know who you are because it's not connecting with them at a deep level. So remember the very beginning of this lecture, you go home for the holidays and your mom starts throwing darts at you. She starts saying, you should do this and you should do that. You should try this and you should try that. And you're going like, whoa. And then you armor up and then you react to that armor. Okay, let's just dissect that for a second. Your mom is engaged in behavior to want you to like them. So she throws, projects on the screen what she thinks will make her feel safe and secure. What will make her feel safe and secure is if you would become a doctor or a lawyer or something like that, right? And do what you and you would do it the way I want you to do it. That would make them feel really safe, right? So she's engaging in that behavior, okay? That behavior is not her. That's what she, her mind has created to make her feel safe and secure. Who she is isn't being let out of the bag. The delicate petals of her flower are not being expressed here because she doesn't feel safe yet. Not she really sure that she can feel safe in the love of her own son or her own daughter, right? 
So you get this dart, oh, I gotta be this, and I should cook this way, and I should do it this way. So you armor up, reacting to a version of her that's not her, and you engage in a version of you, your reaction, which is not you, and then you throw that back at her, and she's reacting to a version of you that's not you, and then she throws that back at you, and like you're reacting to a version of her that's triple times down the road, like to the order of magnitude, not you. And this is how we interact with each other. So far away from taking the risk to let the very delicate petals of the flower open, which I think was the point of this, doctor, uh, this book, um, Mind Over Back Pain. Um, and really so neat that this, this is a really old book, by the way, um, that, that we can actually eradicate pain we can eradicate unwanted emotions, which was what, what, what Candace Pert discovered in her book, Molecules of Emotion. Um, just powerful information for us to become more aware. So in Ayurveda, they were like, okay, that's not that hard to do. All we really need to do is become established in being. So Ayurveda created yoga and breathing and meditation techniques and all these techniques to become more self-aware, right? But the problem is that most of the techniques that I've experienced along the way, meditation courses and techniques, and I lived in India for a couple of years and spent many, many years with spiritual teachers and ashrams and the whole Vedic thing, and, and realized that it was like, go meditate, close your eyes, do the program, and then go live your life. There was no like, remember, there were four words. Oh, four words. Establish, being, perform, action. Where's the perform action part? When are they going to tell us how to act? Well, it's, it's just something that, I don't know, it was missing. And, and this is something that I discovered a long time ago because for 26 years we had a Ayurvedic life spa. It was a Ayurvedic detoxification rejuvenation center where we do Ayurvedic panchakarma treatments where people would come and spend two. We'd do these deep rejuvenation treatments where I would take them and work with them intimately and help them make deep emotional transformation. And it was from becoming more self-aware and then taking action. Think about this for a minute. There's an aspect of the Veda is called Donner Veda. And I wrote an article on this. It's called, uh, it's called Donner Veda, spiritual archery. So think about you're pulling back a bow, right? In archery, okay? Any little movement here of the, where I hold the arrow is gonna have an exponential distorted effect at the level of the target, right? So think about establish being right here and then perform action, release the arrow. To the extent that I can become still here is to the extent that I will have a transformational action step. To the extent that I am moving around, my mind is wandering, monkey mind, doing all these thinking, worrying about everything, juggling your balls about everybody else, what, I, what, the, what do I look like, what do I think, would they like me, all these things that our mind goes and goes, and it's, we all do it. But the more I let myself do it, the more my, my arrow is wandering, and when I try to shoot it, I hit nothing. I transform nothing. I do the same dumb thing again and again and again in my life doing, watching myself, having the same problems, same emotions, same back pain, same leg pain, same gut pain, same heartburn pain, same headache pain. I keep watching my body go down the same thing. So what Ayurveda says is why don't we lay down some new neural pavement. Instead of doing the same dumb thing again and again and again, which we have created a pattern of behavior based on reward chemistry, why don't we take a risk to pull back the bow, meditate, be still, but then the missing piece is to take action. It has to be real action. It can't be just a thought. It has to be real action, transformational action. This is the key. And so if I'm pulling back that arrow, when I let go of that arrow, that, whatever that's going to hit, it's going to be transformational. It's not just some little thought in my head. It's real, okay? So... This is why I actually wrote a meditation course called the Transformational Awareness Technique, which is six meditations to emotional freedom. Each meditation takes you down a little deeper so we can teach you how to 
turn the brain off a little more, a little more each time. But each meditation gives you action steps to tra take transformational action to free yourself from the old patterns of behavior that are making us do the same dumb thing again and again and again, and we can't get out of that circle. And those are the unwanted emotions. And those unwanted emotions are like four lane highways that we drive down every single day. And guess where they go? Right into your intestinal tract, take out your good bugs, your good bugs go, whoa, this is crazy in here. They send a message to your brain, the brain tells everybody the war on, and however you're genetically predisposed to break down, and we all are, we will break down. Does that have to happen? Is something, we're gonna break down, we're gonna get older, there's no question. But can we hack into that aging process? Can we age gracefully? Can we love bigger? Can we give more, feel more content in our life? Damn right. Well, we gotta become conscious. We're not conscious. We're unconscious. We're 95% of the stuff we think and say and do is from the first six years of life. Are you kidding me? That's the best we got. And this is why Ayurveda is so cool, I think, is because the whole thing was based on becoming conscious. And you have to become conscious by doing you, by doing engaging in subjective referral, taking your risk to let the delicate petals of your flower open and let who you are out. And that's what this discussion is really, you know, truly all about. How do we do that? So um, uh, I'll tell you a story about, um, well, I want to, I want to, I think I want to read this one thing to you, which I thought was, uh, from, from that book, I was just sort of fascinated when I was reading this book. Not that the book is necessarily, you know, the book I run out and buy. I, I don't, it, it's old and dated. And, and um, but some of this stuff was really, really cool about becoming aware, become, becoming more aware. And then what we must do with that awareness. So he says, as long as the person remains unaware that the pain is serving as a distraction, just like, Buying a car might be a distraction, an emotional, and not letting you feel an underlying emotion. I don't have to love because I have this new car. I don't have to give and care for others because I have this new dress or shoes or whatever. So it is, so as long as the person remains unaware that the pain is serving as a distraction, it will continue to do so undisturbed. The pain will be undisturbed. But the, but the moment you realize that the emotion is there and it sinks in, not just intellectual appreciation, but deep, deep understanding, the deception doesn't work anymore and the pain stops. Pretty cool, right? I mean, that's exactly what I'm saying. This is a Veda concept. I was just like, whoa, it's so cool to see that that's in fact the case. So I'll tell you a story. We'll, we'll, we'll lighten this up uh, a little bit. Um, years ago, I had, I had a patient come in and, and uh, she said, my husband um, smokes pot every day for 10 years or so. And, uh, and, um, and uh, I take care of the kids and pick them up, take them here. And, and uh, he doesn't have a job. And, and he smokes a lot of pot and, and, um, and I really wish he would stop smoking pot and I wish he would get a job and, you know, be more engaged, you know, and pot, we all know is in Ayurvedic medicine, pot was what we call tamasic, sort of like dulls you out and you kind of, it just sort of makes you feel safer. It's a way of making you feel safer. It dials down the emergency nervous system. So it makes you feel safe. So that's where medical marijuana sort of does come from. It comes from a, a drug that sort of makes you feel safe. But the more you do it, the more you get kind of locked, you can get locked into that, into that space of, of feeling too safe and not want to come out in the world and, and be the sun and let the petals of your flower open and be delicate and vulnerable and powerful. And that's where we can sometimes, that can become a problem. So she told me that, you know, so I said, um, and she said, and, and every time I drive home, the house is a disaster, the fields aren't mowed, the fences are in disrepair, the dog pen's a mess, the wheels, the walls are breaking, the, the walls are falling down, and I yell and scream, we're going to get a job and get a life and fix all these things, he never really does it, and I, and I don't know what to do, and I said, do you love this guy? And she said, yeah. 
And I said, I am curious to know what it is you love about him. Could you do me a favor tonight as homework and write down all the things you love about this guy and make a list of them. But when you write about these things that you love about him or you love about your mother or your father or whoever it is that you're having trouble with, that you have unwanted emotions with, write a list of all the things that you love about that person. But when you write those lists, those things, ask yourself, how does it make you feel? How do you feel when you write about the love, right? So she was like, well, okay. So she went home that night, came back the next day. And I said, how was it? She goes, it was really hard, you know, because I have a lot of resentment that I was deep and buried. So many of our emotional patterns are based on not getting what we wanted as a kid for our birthday present. We created an emotion to feel safe and secure. That emotion got projected on the screen, stuffed in our, our as molecules emotion or mental ama Ayurveda said thousands of years ago and our fat and our muscles. And whenever you trigger that same stress response, boom, that emotion is ready to go. We put it there. We don't ever lose those protective responses. They're ready to go on a moment's notice and boom, they're back. So I said, can you go home tonight? I said, how was it? She said, well, I had a lot of resentment and I had a lot of anger, but when I got through all that resentment and anger, I actually was able to write about the love and it was beautiful. I really, really do love this man. And I really care about him. When I wrote about that, I really felt expanded and I felt warm and fuzzy and I felt so great. I said, wait a minute, for the last 10 years, you have, your mind has convinced yourself that for you to be happy, because she had said I had become sort of angry and irritable and I'm yelling and I'm just not myself and I hate myself and who I've become because I'm so irritated by the situation. And I said, for the last 10 years, your mind had convinced yourself that he had to change, get a job, clean the yard, fix the stove, make the sprinklers work, fix the walls, do all that stuff for you to be happy. So you weren't allowing yourself to love him because your mind said, I will love him when he changes all those things and I'll love him. So you loved him with a big fat condition, lots of conditions. And he didn't feel safe in all those conditions. So he smoked pot and retreated further. And she retreated further because they were not communicating from their heart, they were communicating based on protective patterns that weren't really them. She was doing a version of her that wasn't her. He was doing a version of him that wasn't him. And they had no interaction. So it was like parallel living, not really connecting, not really loving, not really having a relationship, not really bonding, not having a communion, didn't happen. So I said, so for the last 10 years, you convinced yourself that he had to change and you've become this angry version of yourself now that you can't stand. But here, in just a few minutes, you decided to write about all the things that you love about him and all of a sudden, you're all warm and fuzzy and loving and happy and your happiness and your feeling good inside had absolutely nothing to do with him. It was your choice. Like the sun shines. It has nothing, doesn't do it because it knows we want to get a suntan or the flowers need to blossom. It just shines. And when you realize that the truth of that relationship, the truth of you, Ayur Veda, Ayur is life, Veda is truth, uh, Ayur Veda is the truth of your life. The truth of you is that you love him. And the reality was that you weren't acting on your truth. So you were acting on what you thought would make you feel better, which wasn't you. So he was reacting to a version of you that wasn't you. So he didn't react very well to that because it wasn't you. It was, definitely wasn't the you that he left, fell in love with, right? And the version of him that he reacted to the version of you that wasn't you wasn't him. So you weren't reacting to the version of him that you fell in love with either. If you can follow all that. So she's like, whoa. So I said, let's use this template, this, this letter as a template of the truth of the relationship. And every night you go home. Or you think about all the things you love about him, how, made it, how warm and fuzzy you felt, how great you felt, and forget about the yard and the trash and the fields and the fences and all that. Just forget about it. Don't think about it. And just when you see him, put your arms around him, give him a big hug, tell him you love him, and just act on love. Remember, if you pull back the bow, you establish being, you become aware of the truth, and you shoot. 
you act. I said, act on, find out what is the truth of this relationship. Maybe she really didn't love the guy. That's not her truth. It would be a whole different outcome. But she did love him. And the truth was she really, really did. It made her feel great. I said, you want to feel great more? Let's act on that part. Let's stop acting on all, all the things that you don't like about him and start acting on the things that you do like about him because those are your truth, because those are the what expanded you when you expand the good bugs in your gut flourish and the bad bugs disappear. We know people are happy. Their good bugs flourish when they're sad. Their bad bugs flourish. <clears throat> we know when we're loving, giving, and kind, the bugs change in your gut. We have all the science when you're loving and giving and kind, your telomeres on your, on your, on your chromosomes, which measure longevity, uh, lengthen when you're happy and giving and kind and, and still and loving and meditating. And they shorten when you're stressed out. Science goes on and on and on, proving the fact that we do better when we're engaged in loving, giving, caring behavior. So she did that for days. And about, after about a week, she came back in here and she walked into this office and she said, John, guess what? I said, what? She goes, it was a miracle. I said, what? She said, drove home last night. The fields were mowed. The fences were repaired. Dog pens cleaned out. Sprinklers were working. I said, I haven't seen my house look that clean in 10 years. True story, her exact words. Completely changed. And I said, how did you feel in these last couple of days? And she said, you know, it felt so nice not to yell and scream and just to love him, because I do. And I said, how do you think he felt? She goes, I don't know. He cleaned everything up. And I said, he felt safe. Safe enough to let the delicate petals, petals of his flower open, let the truth of him out. And the truth is that he loved you too. And now it's a, it's, a, it's a relationship, it's a communion, it's a marriage. And the unwanted emotions that came from all of that, like, they're gone. They're not a part of the deal anymore. Not that we're not gonna, you know, this is a new road we just laid down. We also have the four lane highway with lights on it that we still like to go down. But the more you start to take action based on the truth, by on the silence, you start laying down new roads in your brain, new neural pathways in the brain. This is good science. And you can then begin to have choice, choice between engaging in the old behavior and driving down the old highway or driving down the new road that is a little riskier, a little more scary because I'm loving being more vulnerable, and all of a sudden you're, you're, you're on your way. One of my favorite exercises is to, uh, is to, um, is to uh, engage in random acts of kindness. Uh, to try, practice just, you know, because you know, not a lot of times you can go into a store, you buy something, you do it, you're in your own little world, and you're not interacting with the, the world around you. You're just sort of doing your own thing. Um, or you're interacting in a way that is sort of like, you know, trying to get that approval or attention. But what about making an effort, random acts of kindness, giving, caring, to, to really give and care by praising, taking, uh, making nice comments to the person behind the register, uh, asking about the waitress and what they do and where they live and where they go to school and getting, just giving yourself more and just laying down some of that pavement because you want to lay down this pavement because these rows are going to be really important one day because in the heat of battle, when someone throws an emotional dart at you and it hurt you emotionally and you have an old molecule of emotion from when you were 12 years old that said, I know how to respond to that. I have an emotion prepared for that. It's pre-recorded. Just push play. All you got to do, I'm ready. I will attack that person. But you also have another option based on that awareness that you can actually realize through awareness and understanding that they are in fact hurt and react with loving and giving and kindness and give and care. And that's the beauty of laying down that pavement. So in the heat of battle, when Thomas was a dart at you, you're gonna be confronted with a choice, a choice you didn't have before because you were so constantly being bombarded with all these darts and constantly reacting unconsciously based on childlike patterns of behavior, protection and safety that we still project on the screen as adults for the rest of our life. This isn't good enough. We can do better. 
you know, in Ayurveda, they call it the, the great battle of the mind. I call it the game of life. Let's play. This is a game. How can I play this game? And how and win? Yeah, yeah, you can win. If that's what makes you go, yeah, let's win this game. How do you win it? Let you out. Take a risk to be delicate. Take a risk to be vulnerable. Take a risk to be giving and loving and kind. Take a risk to love without getting anything in return. Take a risk to give and not care if they give you anything back. Just give because you're the sun and that's who you are and it'll free you. That is Veda. That is Ayurveda. And that is sort of why I fell in love with this whole thing. And, and if you really look closely at what I write about, even my very first book, Body, Mind, Sport, where you did nasal breathing exercise and taught people, triathletes and NBA basketball players how to breathe through their nose when they exercise. What we found was when they do that, their brain waves change into a meditative calm while they're playing basketball. It's called Body, Mind, Sport, Heart Science, published by the International Journal of Neuroscience. That means that I can engage in a stressful, competitive, vigorous exercise and have my brain responding to this as a meditative calm. So my brain is calm and my body is dynamic. This is established being and perform action, sometimes also called the coexistence of opposites. This is a, a Vedic law of nature. Everything in nature has the two opposites coexisting. Nature's most powerful forces represent that in a pretty dramatic way. Think solar systems, think atoms, little things, big things in the center with things spinning around them. Think of a hurricane. The bigger the eye of the hurricane, the more powerful the storm. Most of us live in the storm dodging refrigerators and tree trunks that are flying around the storm, living, dodging, handling the stress, feeling exhausted at the end of every one of our days. What about establishing being, creating that calm and slowly building the winds around that storm till you have a big massive eye of your storm and, there's, and you hail from that place of peace and calm. And you're unshakable, you're invincible. No one can touch you. No one can hurt you. If they don't love you, you have compassion for them because you are the sun, you shine, that's what you do. Yes, of course, there's bad people who don't need to be, be, to be loved and there's all kinds of ways we can look at this and in, 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 in chisel away at what I'm trying to say and in this one hour lecture without having your feedback, it might be, you know, sort of he's crazy, but I'm telling you, you know, and there are people that you're dangerous and you stay away from, there's no question about that. But in the day-to-day -day life with the people that you love, most of us are walking around holding on to our emotions, not letting the truth of us out. That is the game of life. Random acts of kindness throughout the day with the words when it's easy, right? Like with the waitress or the waiter or the people in the grocery store, that's easy. But then using that as the, as the training ground to the final exam to respond to feelings of being afflicted with affection. And then beginning to love unconditionally. So it's a lot of old stuff, and we've all heard this before. A lot of it's nothing really, really new, but it's um, it's powerful. There's a lot of articles. I'm going to just talk about a couple of articles that you guys can read that can give you more information about this. One of them is called "The Magic of Removing Emotional Armor." There's a test there where you can go find out what your emotional body type is and figure out where your what your emotional state is, which is sort of interesting. There's the Donner of Age Spiritual Archery one. There's the psychic, uh, the the uh, the um, uh, the uh, um, psychophysiological, um, the psychophysiology of stress. Sorry. Uh, then there's transform transform your attachments to opportunities. These are all articles. If you type them in, you can. And we'll give you links to the, all these and other ones. And then there's um, mind-boggling benefits of placebo, right? So. That's a whole other discussion, but placebo is a thing that is amazing. I mean, when you read the science on placebo, like here's, a, here's an interesting fact, right? 
in one FDA released the data of a one study that found that more than half the studies on six leading antidepressants were outperformed by the placebo effect. For a drug to get approved, it just needs to outperform the placebo effect by only one time. But in this study, the placebo outperformed the antidepressant six times. It's crazy, right? And placebo effects last, they're permanent. So I'm not gonna dive into so much detail, but if you can get the mind to be happy and joyful, there's a lot of good science to suggest that that will change your body and heal your body. Powerful, power of the mind is very, very powerful. The placebo effect is not something, is not something to mess with. There's one study, I'll read it to you really quickly. Uh, on, anti on antidepressants, 51 subjects were divided into two groups with one group on a placebo and the other on an antidepressant. Both groups experienced relief from depressions. But surprisingly, the placebo group saw measurable changes in the prefrontal cortex of the brain that the person on the antidepressant didn't get. So there were literally brain activation changes from the placebo effect that didn't exist with the actual drug. Study after study, and I've written about that. You can read all those studies in the article, Mind-Boggling Benefits of the Placebo Effect. And there are herbs, meditation, yoga, breathing. Um, read my articles on nasal breathing exercise or my book, Body, Mind, Sport, are very, very important. Herbs to, to, to research on my website, Bacopa, an herb that's been shown to support natural, healthy levels of serotonin and other neurotransmitters, Brahmi, um, uh, melatonin, uh, herbal formulas you can read about on my website called Happy Caps and Tulsi Holy Basil have powerful effects on changing the, the ability to be still, the ability to be silent, the ability to feel, have enough, rebuild the nervous system so it feels safe enough to be calm. And then when you're calm and you're aware, that's you're pulling back the bow. And to the extent that you can be still, is the extent that you can make transformational action. And in my meditation course, the Transformational Awareness Technique, Six Meditations to Emotional Freedom, there's a bunch of free videos there. You can watch on my homepage. You can click on it, learn more about that, and watch all the free stuff. There's the free one-minute meditation you can get. So there's a lot of free stuff there. So click on that, learn about that, and get all the free stuff. Of course, you can take the course as well um, uh, and hopefully enjoy that. But these unwanted emotions, are the tools. They are the track that we have to follow. There's an old saying that says, the pain is directly in the emotion, is directly across from the bliss, the love. And the reason for the pain and the emotion is to get your attention. So you can go to the pain, through the pain, access the truth of you, and let who you truly are out. And free yourself from those unwanted emotions, which, if they weren't there, wouldn't have given you the roadmap to know where to go to be free in the first place. So they're not bad. They are the tools, the fodder to, for transformational change. We can't run away from them or ignore them. We have to become aware of them, but not be attached to them. Remember, we can't be attached to the fruits of our actions. We can't be attached to you liking the gift that I give you. We have to just sort of be aware of them and what they did. And yes, they serve me. They help protect me. I mean, the thorns on the rose help them a lot, you know, and maybe someday they'll get rid of them since there's not that much trampling going on anymore. We'll see about that. All right, please check out all this information on the, on the, uh, from this podcast uh, at lifespa.com. And you can get more of our podcast there as well. Thanks for listening. I'm Dr. John Viard.